So that works pretty well. It's a good way to think about things that, okay, there's different energy levels. Electrons can move between the energy levels, but they can't be in between energy levels. This is sort of a first approximation of quantum mechanics. Um, and this gives us what's called the principal quantum number. The principal quantum number is another way of saying, is the mathematical physics way of saying energy level. All right, so it turns out that we had to get a little bit more com um, complicated than that. This is just like immediately after um, a Dalton came up with his atomic theory, it immediately had to be revised because Thompson found the electrons right after that, right? Same thing with the Bohr model. Bohr figured this out and then immediately after that said, well, turns out if you zoom in enough, you actually need to get more complicated to explain this. And so they came up with a set of what are called quantum numbers. Um, and quantum numbers, really only physicists call them the quantum numbers for, because for the most part in chemistry, we describe, we use more descriptive terms. So uh, I know at least some of you have heard of electron configurations before, right? An electron configuration basically is the, the series of quantum numbers that describe one specific electron. So your principal quantum number is your energy level. So when I say 1s2, 1 is the principal quantum number. They also call it n. You might be autocorrect about that. Usually it's represented as a lowercase n. But the other ways that we need to be able to describe this is because it turns out that if we're representing these different um, energy or these electrons as these probability functions, these waves, and these probability functions, and really that's probability functions, not even quite right. It turns out that if you take the wave function and square it, you get the probability um, function. Um, so, but they basically are represented by these just three-dimensional mathematical functions, and they look kind of weird and kind of hard to predict until you realize. Um, you guys remember when we talked about the guitar strings and said, okay, well, if it's a standing wave, if you take a standing wave and you connect the two ends instead of saying that they're fixed, like on a guitar, that's kind of how the how the uh, electronic functions behave. That's not inaccurate, except more like, I guess, what's the mathematical function you would use to describe a wave? Who's taken algebra two recently? A sine wave, right? So picture a sine wave, except you do it in spherical coordinates instead of in x, y coordinates. So you get a function that looks like an up and a down, except it's it's kind of r is a function of angle and in two dimensions rather than um, simply up and down and up and down following the x-axis forever. That's what these shapes actually come from. It's just a it's just a mathematical model or a mathematical function that's used to describe where you're likely to find electrons. Um, and but the root of it is that it's essentially a sine wave in spherical coordinates, which is why you kind of get these repetitive notions. The shorthand way of showing this the shape of a p orbital is a figure eight, basically, right? And you can kind of if you think of that as being R gets bigger as one angle gets bigger and then it hits the maximum like a sine wave and then R starts getting smaller as you have that, that repetitive motion. So it's a little bit hard to wrap your head around, but one of the things that always was really weird to me when I was in undergrad um, was where these shapes come from. And it wasn't until I got to grad school and I had this, um, I think he was Polish, this Eastern European um, really, really old guy who has started off our first class with, well, what is a function? And his, you know, weird, trying to think who they sounded a little bit like um, uh, Donald Pleasant. Um, you wouldn't know that, right? Anyway, um, just <laughs> old guy, white hair, beard, what you think of when you think of a, a Eastern European physics professor. Um, he's, it's just a function. A function is just describes where the electron is. And, uh, he also got really mad anytime anybody mispronounced any of the Eastern European names. You couldn't say Planck's constant, or he threatened to fail you. Planck's constant. Um, he was picky like that. Anyway, Joseph Mickel taught me. It's just a function. It's a mathematical function that shows where you're likely to find an electron. But the thing that goes along with it is just like with sine waves, um, 
or if you think about sine waves in, how many of you have had any physics? A little bit of sound waves, um, thinking about sound waves as being a sine wave, right? You think about the frequency of a sine wave. Um, if we think about frequency, which of these is gonna have higher energy as a frequency? The more wavy, second the more wavy one, right? And that's actually a perfect answer because technically the energy in a wave um, is proportional to the curvature of the wave. So the more wavy it is, the higher energy it is. Electronic orbitals behave the same way. The lowest energy orbitals are the ones that just look like a sphere because there's less curvature than if you take that sphere and turn it into a figure eight. And that has less curvature than if you took it a d orbital, looks almost like a clover leaf. A higher energy orbital looks mo uh, more like a clover leaf. Because the higher energy you get to for these, the more curvature you have to have. Right? And so Bohr's model was adapted with this in mind. And so we basically said, OK, well, in addition to this principal quantum number, we also have to have these suborbitals. Right, and that's where we kind of ended. I mentioned the S block versus the P block versus the D block. We didn't really spend much time on it. Um, the second quantum number is also what's known as the, is the make sure I can see if I can get the name right. Um, I hardly ever use these names because we usually we just say S orbital or P orbital. But I believe it's the angular momentum quantum number. The angular momentum quantum number basically tells you what type of orbital you have. And so your angle, angular momentum quantum number, which is usually, I guess, M, can be anything from zero to whatever n is. n can be just any integer. For a specific electron, m can be anything. No, sorry, it's wrong, it's l. l. L can be anything from zero up to n. And we'll come back in a second to help. That's going to actually be helpful in a minute. Um, and then within that, if you look at the, the diagram up here, it has two, three different kinds of p orbitals listed. There's p sub z, p sub y, and p sub x. Those x, y, and z are basically describing which axis in Cartesian coordinates does that figure eight follow. So the P sub Z goes up and down because that's following the Z axis. The P sub Y is gonna be 90 degrees to that following the Y axis. And P sub X is 90 degrees to both of those following the X axis. Right? Remember if we use Cartesian coordinates in three dimensions, you get X, Y, and Z. So the P sub X would be drawn as a figure eight following the X axis. P sub Y follow the Y axis and P sub Z follows the Z axis. So they all kind of exist on top of each other. It looks really complicated. It is really complicated when you try and show more than one at the same time, which is why we usually split them up and show them as three different things. But they're all the same curvature though. They're all the same energy. It's just basically if you have this shape, if you have a function with this wave um, characteristics and with this curvature, there are three ways you can arrange it such that they're all going to be 90 degrees to each other or linearly independent, to use the math term. Um, or the other math term is orthogonal to each other. So if we're saying, OK, within our p orbital, all three of these together is considered the p orbital. So we'd say overall a p orbital can hold six electrons, two electrons into each of these. But if we wanted to, to be specific about which of those three possible suborbitals an electron is, we use the third 
the third quantum number, and if L is the angular momentum quantum number, I can't remember what we call M sub L at all, um, but that's okay. Because all it really is doing is distinguishing, is it P sub Y or P sub X or P sub Z that we're talking about? And there's limits the same way that we could only have frequencies at certain or certain frequencies would give us a harmonic on the guitar string. There's only certain numbers that you can plug into these functions that give you an answer that makes sense. That's not a contradiction, right? The same way that if you try to solve the quadratic equation to, to find the roots for a parabola that doesn't cross the, the X axis, you get a non-real number, right? The same thing happens if you try to solve, if you try to model these functions with quantum numbers that don't work. If you pick the wrong quantum numbers, you get a nonsensical answer. So there's, there, we're limited basically by what N is and by the laws of physics and the laws of math as to what the possibilities are for these other quantum numbers. So M sub L can be anything from magnetic number. Magnetic number. Thank you. Uh, that's the spin number. That's M sub S, isn't it? Or is that say, is that M sub L? Uh, magnetic quantum number. Okay. So that's our magnetic number then. Th then the other one must just be spin. You can go from negative N to zero to positive N. Is spin. Yeah, they just call it spin. And the last one is uh, is what we were just discussing. M sub S is called spin, except it's not really spinning. So basically, if we if we think about these as being waves or think about these these things having angular momentum, um, picture being able to to spin a basketball on your finger. You could put the same amount of energy into it and get to spin on your finger if you balance it. You could spin it one way, but you could put the same exact energy into it and get to spin the other way. The fact that there are two options, you could have it spinning both ways and still have the ball spinning and model that with the same number and have it the same energy. It turns out electrons have a property that's kind of like that too. We say spin up or spin down partly because we don't want to say clockwise or counterclockwise because literally it's not really spinning. It just has this intrinsic property. This is another case kind of like, remember how I said that we really don't have the firmware to understand quantum. Um, we can just describe it with math. The math is very similar to you can spin a ball clockwise or counterclockwise and have the same energy, but an electron's not actually spinning, but the math looks like it's spinning. So it's it's not physically spinning, but so we just say it can be spin up or spin down. We represent that as plus one half or minus one half. Right, so this is a lot of complex, complicated, very conceptual. I didn't give you any of the math behind this, um, but effectively, if you have the right, if you have quantum numbers that follow these rules, then that you're describing one possible energy state where you could find an electron, right? So you're describing one of the possible harmonics on our guitar string. But the thing is you have to have all four of these quantum numbers and they all have to follow the same rules or it doesn't work. Your function just falls apart. Like trying to have a guitar string where one end is not fixed. I don't know if any of you have ever changed guitar strings or play guitar at all but if you can picture trying to trying to pluck a guitar string where one end is not attached you don't get anything really happening right i mean you can't even really call it a vibration that's the same thing that would happen is if you tried to plug in a set of quantum numbers that didn't follow these rules like if l was too big for the energy level you were in you get an answer that doesn't make sense right and Again, like I've mentioned before, I tried, I basically just wrote off the concept of orbitals when I was an 18 year old and I was taking this. I just, I'm going to take the hit on the points and just not worry about it. And I'm just going to do good enough on the rest of the test. And that way I don't have to study it because I got to the table that looked like this in the textbook. 
and it didn't make any sense to me. So I get that it's weird. The bullet point of what I want you to take away from this is that there are, there are practical limits mm -hmm. to what you can plug in. And this describes one, this describes why you can't have a P orbital in the first energy level. Because what's N for the first energy level? One, and actually this is N minus one. That there it is. And this is L. This is what happens when I go off the cup rather than sticking to my notes. Um, if N is one, there's only one possible value for L. And that's what we call, when L is equal to zero, that's what we call an S orbital. When N is two, L can be zero or it can be one. Zero is an S orbital. L equals one is a P orbital. So basically every time you go up an energy level, you get a new type of orbital that you can add. You can't have a D orbital in the second energy level because that would be like plugging in a value of L that's too big. The function just doesn't work. M sub L tells us the size of each orbital. So how many possible values are there for M sub L um, for an S orbital? If L equals zero, how many possible values are there that we could plug in here? It's kind of tricky. You have to phrase your answer properly. There is one value and that value is zero. So that's why an S orbital can only hold two electrons. That's why the S block on the periodic table is only two col or two columns wide. Is because you can only have one possible value for M sub L. If L is one, how many values are there for M sub L? L is one, you can have negative one, zero, and positive one, right? Which is why this P block is six elements across. You can put six electrons into a P orbital because there's three possible values for P for M sub L. So how wide is the D block gonna be? First off, what's L for a D orbital? We're just counting in integers, right? Okay. We'll come back to that then. I, I, go, I go to that because once you get used to thinking about this, when you look at the periodic table, you see the electronic structure, but we'll come back to that part in a second. I'll make this point again. All right. Go back to this one. So for an energy level where n equals one, there's only a couple possible values you can fill in, right? If n is one, L can only be zero. M sub L can only be zero, which means, and then there's the spin that can be plus one, plus one half or minus one half. That means in the entire first energy level, you can only hold two electrons. If you go to the next energy level, we have more possibilities. We have the 2s orbital we can put electrons in, and then we also have a new type of orbital. And when L is one, we get a p orbital. And a p orbital has three possible places to put electrons, right? X, Y, and Z. They can all, all hold two electrons each. Every time you go up one energy level, you add a new type of orbital. Right, so when you go to three, you got three has an S orbital, a P orbital, and a D orbital. Four has an S orbital, a P orbital, a D orbital, and an, an F orbital. Good. That's actually what those bottom two columns are, or bottom two rows that don't get drawn in the rest of the periodic table. Those are consult called the F block elements. What happens when we go to the fifth energy level? There's not even room on the slide to show it. 
But if we go to n equals five, we add one more type of orbital, right? So after the f orbital, we get to orbitals nobody's ever seen experimentally before. But mathematically, we can prove they exist. We just can't get elements big enough to be able to, to experimentally verify. But you get g orbitals. And then you, get, then you go alphabetical from there. Um, but those are all still hypothetical. Not hypothetical, theoretical, because we have not have experimental evidence for them. Right, so these are the different ways, all these are is the functions that solve the quantum equations, solve the Schrodinger equation, they give us a real answer. They give us a shape um, of an orbital where we can find the, the electrons. They also all have an energy associated with them. And remember the bookshelf analogy from Friday, we said, okay, if you're, gonna, if you're trying to fill up a bookshelf with books, and you're worried about an earthquake, so you want to do it the most stable way possible. How do you start filling it up? From the bottom up, right? Low energy to high energy. We do the same thing when we're filling up electronic orbitals. You start from the lowest energy and move upward. All right, so let me jump backward. That's actually, there's, this is a scary looking word. It seems scary looking because it's German um, and German words in general look kind of scary if you're used to speaking English. Um, Alphabal principle literally means building up principle. Alphabal principle. <laughs> Does it actually mean building up principle? Yeah. Okay. So building up principle means you start the low energy and you add electrons progressively higher. Right, but we can't put all of the electrons into the lowest possible energy state because we're limited. You can, the other aspect of these quantum numbers is that no two particles, no two electrons can ever have identical quantum numbers in the same system. In two separate atoms, yes, but for one system, which we'll call, say one atom, you can't have an identical set of quantum numbers. Right, and that's what is known as the Pauli exclusion principle. Um, Wolfgang Pauli was in that picture from Solvang. Um, he, he says every electron must have unique quantum numbers. So each orbital that we represent with one of these horizontal lines can only hold two electrons, one spin up, one spin down. And then last but not least, the last one that we care about for right now is Hung's rule, which says if you have orbitals that are the same energy, which way in physics they call that degenerate, degenerate orbitals, you always put one electron into each orbital before you start doubling up. And the analogy I use for this is um, it's like if you, there's a bunch of people that don't know each other getting onto a bus. You don't start having anybody double up seats until all of the free seats are taken, right? Or getting on an airplane for that matter. You always go and go until you find the row that's totally empty. Take that seat before anybody's going to want to start doubling up. All right. So what this means is we can actually represent, if we know how many electrons we have in the system, we can show what those electrons are going to look like, what's called the electron configuration, just by following those three rules. Each orbital, fill from the bottom up, each orbital can hold two electrons, one up, one spin up, and one spin down. And when you get to orbitals where you have multiple orbitals with the same energy, you start, you fill each of them halfway before you start doubling up. Um, interestingly enough, so that's a, a physical law, not a, a theoretical law, um, but turns out mm -hmm. unpaired electrons that have the same spin pointed in the same direction, um, that's actually what explains magnetism, why some elements are magnetic and some aren't, is be, in order for something to be a magnetic material, you have to have unpaired electrons. And it's more favorable energetically. It's lower energy if they're all pointed the same direction. All right, so when we're filling in our orbitals, 
with, with electrons, which, which again, we're just going to represent as arrows pointing up or down. We do that um, because that's going to help us explain some physical properties and how they react. So if we have anything in the first two rows of the periodic table, it's pretty straightforward. And here's where we're going to connect it to the periodic table. Is if you want to know what the electron configuration for oxygen is, you basically follow along on the periodic table till you've added enough electrons. And the shape of the periodic table tells you where you're putting the electrons. But then again, these, these molecular or the atomic orbital energy diagrams do a pretty good job of explaining it too. So we say that's our 1s orbital. Here's our 2s orbital. And then there's our 2p orbital. If we want to represent the electrons for oxygen, we say, okay, we look at oxygen. When oxygen's neutral, how many total electrons does it have? Eight, right? We're good at counting subatomic particles, right? That's got that one down. So eight electrons, we just start at the bottom and start filling in these orbitals. Two electrons per orbital till we till we get to eight. So first two electrons go in the 1s orbital. Then they go into the 2s orbital. We've used four of our eight. We have four electrons left. One, two, three. Draw all three of them with the same spin before we start doubling up. How many electrons have we used now? We need one more, right? So we have to double up one of the seats on the bus. Yeah. Can you always draw them up first? That's just habit doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if you draw them up on the left and down on the right. Um, as long as one's up and one's down, that's all that matters. Right? And, and yes, drawing them up first and then down is just, just habit. I can't think of if I ever even learned it that way or if I've just looked at enough of these that I've decided that's the way that I draw them um, subconsciously. <laughs> right? So this... At, at its core, this is what, it, what an electron configuration is. We're describing the state of the electrons because that's going to tell us some things about that element and how it reacts. All right, so, but there is a shorthand as well um, that we would represent. Basically, you just say what energy level, what type of orbital, and how many electrons are in it. And so we would write that just as. 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. So that you don't have to draw out this diagram every single time. If somebody's familiar with this and they see 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, they could fill this in really easily, right? Once you know how the order, how it goes. All right. And that's, that's how we go back to going back to the periodic table. We use the periodic table to fill these in. There we go. Because the different pieces of the periodic table can be are representing different orbitals being filled up. When you look at this, it looks really complicated and it it puts the F block, those bottom two rows, um, in the middle. This is actually what the shape of the periodic table is supposed to look like. Thing is, um, we didn't always have widescreen TVs, and cutting out those the F block and putting it down below and smushing everything else together made it fit better on a piece of paper. This is the actual shape of the periodic table. And the rows on the periodic table correspond to which energy level you're in. So if, if we want to know how to fill up the, the orbitals from the bottom up, we literally start at hydrogen and you count along the periodic table. You just follow the atomic numbers on the periodic table until you get to the right number of electrons for your system. Right, And so that's why we, we break it up into what's called the S block, the P block, 
the D block and the F block. When you're counting, so let's go back here. When we're counting our electrons for oxygen, we start at hydrogen. We say, okay, hydrogen's in the first row. Therefore, it's in the first energy level. Hydrogen's in the S block. So it's 1s. The first electrons we're going to put uh, we're going to put into the system go into the 1s orbital. And the 1s orbital can hold a total of two electrons. What's after the 1s orbital? 2s. After we go to the first two electrons, we filled the first row of the periodic table, right? We filled the first energy level. So we go to n equals 2. Look at the periodic table. You're looking at lithium and beryllium now. That's the second row in the S block. So it's, we're putting electrons into an S orbital and the S orbital is still two electrons wide, two elements wide, which means it can hold two electrons. Once you get through the two S orbital, what's next? Two, it's still in the second row of the periodic table. So it's still two. And we jumped across from beryllium to boron. So now we're in the P block. The P block can hold up to six, but we run, if we're talking about oxygen, we run out of electrons before we get there. So when you get to the last, you get to the, the part of the periodic table that has your element, in this case, oxygen, you just count over till you get to your element. Oxygen, we started counting at boron, five, six, seven, eight. It's four more electrons left. So we'd say 2P4. All right, so does it make, even if that's a little bit hazy, we'll get some more practice with it. Does it make more sense why I kept saying, that's why the periodic table is the, the shape that it is, right? The P block is six elements across because a P orbital can hold six electrons. Because M sub L for a P orbital, it could be minus one, could be zero, could be plus one. If it's a D orbital, if it's a D orbital, then that means L is equal to two, right? And if L is equal to two, how many values are, are there for M sub L? Negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. There's five possibilities, right? So if there are five possibilities here, that means That means that there's five lines that are degenerate in that we would all consider the whole thing to be the D orbital. So if there's five lines, how many electrons can we hold? 10, how many elements across is the D block? 10, yeah. Would you ever describe M sub L as like the, the axis that the shape exists on? Um, yes. It gets that gets tricky when you get to d orbitals because they don't follow a single. It's like xz. Uh, and yeah. yeah, so for the but for the p orbitals, yes, that's exactly right. They have to be orthogonal to each other. They have to be ninety degrees to each other. So the easiest way to represent that for a p orbital is saying, okay, one of my figure eights follows the x axis, one follows y, and one follows z. All right? D orbitals. The idea of orthogonal gets more complicated than just perpendicular when you get to d orbitals. They have to be linearly independent, but that doesn't mean that they have to follow axes. Um, basically, L is the number of nodes in your function. So for an S orbital, there's no nodes. Remember, the node was where that spot where the um, there was zero vibration on the, on the guitar string. We could say like, this is the node right in the middle. So for a p orbital, p orbitals all have one node 
one that goes straight through the middle there, or one that goes up and down here, or one that goes in um, 90 degrees to the other two here. So L is the number of nodes in the function. And that means that your, your functions get really a lot more complicated when you get to, to L equals two. There's five different ways you can have orthogonal functions to each other, but they're not perpendicular anymore because spherical coordinates and linear algebra get weird. Um, at least com compared to my way of thinking. All right, so last theoretical question about M sub L, and that'll probably be the last time I ask you about M sub L. What about for the F block? Without looking at your periodic table, why? You said, who said 14? Um, why? Because it's 14 across on the periodic table? Because if L is three, there's seven values for M sub L. Seven times two is 14. So there's going to, for an, for an F orbital, there's going to be seven of those lines that are all degenerate. Which is why most of the, the strongest naturally occurring magnets um, are elements that you can find in the F block or they're in the fifth or the sixth row or below because that's where you find the F block elements. Because the more possible degenerate orbitals you have, the more unpaired electrons with the same spin you can have. The more unpaired electrons with the same spin you can have, the stronger the magnetic field it generates. Incidentally, do you guys know that, that oxygen is magnetic? O2, O2 is a magnetic gas. Um, it actually does, is affected by magnetic fields. And you can see that if you have liquid oxygen, liquid oxygen boils at about the same temperature as liquid nitrogen. If you take liquid oxygen and you pour it in between the poles of a magnet, of a really strong magnet, you can actually see the stream of liquid oxygen curving to follow the magnetic um, field, which is kind of cool. Yeah, exactly. And it gets, it gets more complicated too when we're not just talking about a single atom at a time. Because when we have a crystal structure built of all of these with unpaired, all these unpaired electrons, they, their atomic orbitals aren't really atomic orbitals anymore. They start behaving as molecular orbitals and mixing together. Um, and that, uh, that affects the magnetism as well. But in theory, the strongest possible single atom magnet you could have would be something that had a D orbital exactly halfway filled and an F orbital exactly halfway filled. But there's a whole field of study that goes into trying to apply these ideas to solid states because solid phases behave differently than atoms on their own or even things like gases. Um, if you're interested in that, that field of, of study is called material science. Material science is basically applied physics and chemistry on solids and liquids to develop new cool stuff like better batteries or stronger magnets or superconductors. Um, that's a separate field of study, even though it's based around um, the, it's still based around physics and chemistry, um, but you can actually get a whole separate degree um, for that, which is, it's really pretty cool. One of my, my, my good friend in grad school studied material science in undergrad, and then his research was on developing better cathode materials for lithium ion batteries, um, which again, Pretty cool stuff. All right, there's one other thing. So if we're gonna look at the electron configuration for carbon, if you have your orbital energies drawn out and you've labeled them properly, it's pretty straightforward. You just count until you get to what? Well, you don't even have to be able to count. You literally just follow the periodic table until you get to carbon. First thing you do is you put two electrons into the first energy level into an S orbital. Basically, everything past helium is always going to start with 1s2. That's the lowest possible energy state. 
So I'm going to do this simultaneously, filling it in here versus writing the shorthand. We're trying to get to carbon, right? So we finished the first row. We're on to the second row. The S orbital can hold two electrons still. Okay, now we're moving over to the second row to the P, or P block. So, and we have, so we're still second energy level. Still, now we're into the P orbital. How many electrons do we have to put in? It's two. Carbon's in the second column in the P orbital. All right, so writing these electron configurations is really, really straightforward if you have your periodic table and you know how to how to break it up in your head. Yeah. The only way it gets any more complicated, and the reason that I spent time explaining um, the the quantum numbers is because the periodic table is a physical law, meaning they the structure of it is built to match observation, not theory. So the fourth row of the periodic table is the first time you see a d, a d orbital, right? But the first d orbital that you run into is when you go from n equals two to n equals three. All right, so in this graph, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, normally if we we're just filling up the third energy level, we would go from 3p to 3d. But that d orbital is actually higher in energy than 4s. So the reason that I made the point earlier that I spent time explaining every time you go up an energy level, you add a new type of orbital is because yes, the first d orbital shows up in the fourth row, but it really belongs in the third energy level. But basically that's, a, that's the only time it really gets any more complicated than that. There are some weird exceptions that happen in the middle of, a, of a, the d block. Basically when you get to the d block is when things get weird. Everything up to the D block is normal. It's going to follow the same rules where it literally is just as simple as what we just did. Count until you get to the right number of electrons. When you get to the D orbital, it gets a little bit weird. So if we looked at zinc, it's not a half bad Canadian goose impersonation. Um, if we look at zinc, where's zinc on the periodic table? Zinc, number 30. All right, this one I'm going to, I'm not going to do on the board. I'm not going to fill in the orbitals on the board because we've run out of room on the, on the whiteboard here. But if we need to fill in 30 electrons, we're just going to start at the bottom and work our way up till we get to 30, right? 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. That gets us up to 10, right? That's corresponds to n days a second row of the periodic table. Then we get three. We're in third row of the periodic table in the S block. 3s2, 3p6. That gets us all the way up to argon. Now we're at 18 electrons. We're, and this is where it gets weird. If we were just trying to follow and fill the third energy level, we would next go to 3d. But because it's actually lower in energy to go to 4s first, we're going to sit, go 3p6, 4s2, and then go back to 3d10. Okay. All right. Does that make sense? Feel like we could do some some um, electron configurations? You give it a try. Good. Uh, I had some practice ones on here. Uh, this this is kind of cool. I want to show you this real quick. This is a periodic table. Turns out you don't have to arrange your periodic table just the way you're used to seeing it. I already showed you one example of a different periodic table that looked like this, right? 
It's the same basic shape, but we put the F block back where it begins. This is a periodic table where everything's arranged to look like our, our atomic orbital energy diagram, where you start at the bottom and you count up and the different colors correspond with different energy levels. So all the red ones are N equals two. All the um, orange is N equals, sorry, red is N equals one. Orange is N equals two. Yellow is, is N equals three. And you can see every time you go up one energy level, you add a new type of orbital. Going from one to two, you add a p orbital. Going from two to three, you add a d orbital. From three to four, you add an f orbital. All right, so what I probably will have you do an assignment at some point. It'll probably be the only writing assignment you do for this class. Um, basically, where I have you look at a database online of different ways of, of, of designing the periodic table. Um, and then you just have to talk about what it does right, what it gets wrong, and why you chose it. There's basically you pick three of them for, to fit three different categories. Um, but basically, depending on what you're doing, there are different periodic tables. This is a periodic table that's trying to illustrate the different energy levels and how they tie along, how they tie into counting along on the periodic table. Um, there's some others that are shaped differently. There's three-dimensional periodic tables. Hang on, uh, let's see. It's... So if it's three-dimensional, do you have to solve the way I'll show you. And don't be thrown off by the, by the, um, the interface here, it looks like it's stuck in the in the 1990s. Um, but this this website is pretty cool. <laughs> For instance, let's see. This one. This is the one. <laughs> So here's a periodic table that you can actually print off and fold up and tape. It's a periodic table in the shape of a pyramid. Well, one thing it does is it allows you to follow the different um, properties. Um, the, different, the different columns going at different angles are going to show you different properties. They're going to correspond to rows versus columns. Um, <laughs> Check this one out. So you can actually write the periodic table still in a grid format, but having them arranged so that they stack on top of each other. Yeah, how do you read that? So this is L equals zero. L equals zero is an S orbital, right? Yeah. So this is your S block right here. <laughs> and your S block has, eight, has seven rows in it up to eight. Then you've got your P block which is shaped into six across, and it, there's how many rows in the, on the P block? There's six, right? So it's six by six. Your D block is gonna be 10 by four, mm -hmm. and your F block is going to be 14 by two. And so you can actually take these and rearrange them and change the shape of it to represent it in 3D and get something. Okay. Where you can actually make your your um, electron configurations by doing this in use n n equals one two three four five six seven eight. There's your m sub l. Right. Um. Well, look at the periodic table. Currently on the periodic table, there's there's uh, seven rows in the s block, but they added next one. In anticipation of more elements. All right. 
<laughs> Not us personally. All right, let's practice writing some electron configurations now. I forgot that that side was there. I know I told you we do practice. So now let's do practice. This is the big skill for the day. The rest of this is the basis for the skill. So you're not just memorizing something with not without understanding the logic or the concepts behind it. Try writing these out. I'll give you a few minutes. Talk to each other. Use it. Get the wiggles out as I tell my nine-year-old. <laughs> Oh, you already did oxygen. Already did oxygen. So skip oxygen. Pick another one of your choice. True. How about do selenium instead? Do selenium instead of oxygen. Yeah, this this slide used used to be recapped for the next lecture, but because of the way we're hitting the lectures, it's in the middle today. Sorry, hang on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll explain why in a bit. And then, you know, I think the three We'll talk about the, um, about the abbreviations in, in a minute. For now, I'll list them all while we're practicing. So you can't possibly mix up 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Hey, what's up, Philip? That said, if you want to do it that way and you remember how to do it, go for it. It still comes after four S two. Thank you. 
So please be help me in the uh, 4P10. No, 4P10? Oh, to do the abbreviation? So argon, if argon goes all the way to here, then you would write as... Yeah. We'll talk about it in a second once everybody's gone through this one. For some people, that's really all. <laughs> you ever have them use the uh, so I uh, I find just reading the table that table is that's not the exact same. Exactly. But it is, the only thing, the only trick is 3D. Yeah. You only have box offset by two. Yes. Um, and that's what the diagonal does take that into account. Yeah. 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 I remember that. And, I mean, yeah. Right. That works for you. Go for it. Because I want to push this whole five. Right. You just have to learn how to use the Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. right. And so, like I think I saw that when I was in Gen Chem, and I used it a little bit, but then pretty quickly I figured out that you could just use the periodic table, and it's just not worth it. Um, if you're doing it on a regular basis, you always have a periodic table, and a lot of times it's just faster to look at the periodic table than it is to write that out every time. <laughs> okay. All right, how'd that go? Piece of cake once you know the rules, right? Couple things I want to talk about though. Let's go through it real quick. A couple of clarification points. So, first off, reminder that your D block is always going to be your energy level for your D block is always off by one row, right? Because you don't get to the D block until after the F, the S block from the higher energy level. Go back here. Look at where 3D hits on the energy level versus 4S. 3D is a little bit higher than 4S. So you go to 4S first, and then you come back to 3D. Right? So even though the D block, the first part of the D block starts on the fourth row of the periodic table, it actually belongs in the third energy level. So you get something weird like this. For selenium, you get 4S2, then you're in the D block, but it's the 3D orbital you're filling up. And then you go back to 4P. The F orbitals work the same way, except they're offset by two rows. For the same reason, it, it didn't fit on here. 
but on this on this periodic table, our F block is higher in energy than the S block for the higher level, for the P block for the higher level, and for the D block than the D block for the level before it. Right, so your first row in the F block belongs to N equals four. So let's look at let's look at uh, radon real quick, just because this has all the trickiest parts for, that you might have to think about. Try and do radon. I'll give you a couple second head start. R N eighty six. Oh. All right. After we get to four P, after we get to four P six, we're trying to get to radon. Where do we go from four P six? Five S two. Our D block is offset by a row, so it's 4D10. Then we're back to 5, P, 6. That takes us to xenon. So now we need to go one, one more row, right? 6, S, 2. And now we get to the F block. All right, so it's an F orbital. You joke, but you never know. We wouldn't say the whole thing. We would, but if I was talking to another chemist, we were talking about about radon and its properties. We might bring up the electron configuration, and we talk about like, oh, the the six s the six s electrons can interact with the six p electrons to cause this. Roughly. I'm not sure that I could get 100% on the elements quiz at this point because I haven't been studying. That the fifth or the uh, sixth and seventh rows still get me sometimes. So when when you were in the middle, yeah, like if you were when you're in Gen Chem, yeah, you wind up memorizing it just because you use it a lot. All right, after four F fourteen, look at the periodic table. That takes us through the, the F block. And then we're in 5, D10, 6, 6P6. Six six. We're going all the way to radon. Okay? Couple couple things to clarify. You guys want, are going to want to hear this because I get this question all the time. A lot of textbooks we'll have all of the threes together and all the fours together, even though you fill them up in a different order. I typically like them in this order because I write my electron configurations by following the periodic table. Some textbooks though, will look at this and say, oh, well, it should be 3s2, 3p6, 3d10, and then 4s2. But that's backwards. That doesn't match with what we know from the periodic table, right? So I like it in this order, but when you see, when you get down here, you can kind of see why, because 6 f 6s2, 4f14, 5d10, 6p6 gets kind of convoluted to follow what's happening um, until you get really good with the periodic table. Yeah. So is it like, is it wrong if you, as long as you have everything but the different orders, like if they want to keep all the s's or hmm, that, that's yeah. one I hadn't thought of before. Um, I've never seen that done, grouping all of the s's, all the p's, all the d's together. Um, I wouldn't say it's wrong. That would be you would have everything where it needs to be, right? The order shouldn't matter. You write the order how it's convenient for you, which usually means you follow the periodic table. Yeah, Jay. Like, if you're talking about like radon or something, it's just like right. Over all the way down here, so we're just going to all the ones above it. Who got sick of writing 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6? 
Never. I like that answer. Um, there is a shorthand. For this class, I'm going to specifically say you're only allowed to use this shorthand when you get past 18 electrons. So when you get past argon, you're allowed to use this shorthand. But basically, you just you say, well, everything up to the last noble gas is going to stay the same. So why would I rewrite 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6 every single time? So what you can do instead, if we wanted to write the electron configuration for selenium, see selenium was, I'm just going to reuse this part. Selenium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p4. The shorthand way of doing that is you go to the last noble gas, which in this case, we're talking about selenium. And again, noble gas is gonna be the far right column on the periodic table. Not again, I haven't said that yet. Um, but in case you didn't know that term. So you'd say, okay, well, everything up to argon is just like normal. So you just put argon in brackets. And that means everything is the same up to argon. And then you list what's different after argon. So it would be argon and then 4s2, 3d10, 4p4. For this class, if I'm asking you about an electron configuration for something that's before argon with 18 electrons or less, that's because I want to test whether you can do 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. Right, so I'm specifically asking you to write out the complete electron configuration if I'm asking you about anything with 18 or fewer electrons. As soon as you get greater than 18 electrons, you're allowed to do this. Or you can write it out the whole way. Um, if that, if you don't mind the extra writing, you have the time, that's totally fine. It's always good practice. I'm, you wanna be able to, at least for those first three rows of the periodic table, you want to be able to do this in your sleep. You know, when, when your mom comes to check on you at night, I want you to be whispering 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 in your sleep. Right? Literally, you should be dreaming about electron configurations. And hopefully it won't be nightmares. Um, but that's one last piece of advice. This comes from my old PI in grad school. If you're not dreaming about chemistry, you're not working hard enough. All right. Now, he wasn't the best at promoting healthy work-life balance, but at the same time, when you're working hard at something, you probably are going to dream about it a little bit. You should be, you know, it's like playing Tetris, and then you go to sleep, and you see Tetris pieces falling. You just have different number of electrons, right? Okay. So like, so if we were looking at selenium mm -hmm. and selenium makes a minus two ion, that means it's got two extra electrons, right? So, so, it, so for the like, ion, it wouldn't be 4p4, it would four, be 4p6. Four, okay. So it works it's the okay. same exact way. We just adjust it based okay. on how many electrons we actually have. Yeah, I'm